good. So welcome everybody um, to our Friday morning panel. Uh, the title of which is Rethinking New Orleans, Race, Labor, Violence, and Representation. Uh, this is actually a round table, so we want to encourage discussion as much as possible. So our presenters are limiting their comments to um, a few minutes, and I will introduce each uh, person before they deliver their comments, and then we will have a discussion, I hope, um, about this topic. And I'm really excited. This constellation of scholars' work is really exciting, and uh, so it should be a good discussion. So um, I'm Molly Mitchell. I'm at the University of New Orleans, and I'm at the Midlow Center for the Study of New Orleans. Um, and um, I am going to be sort of trying to stay in the background as much as possible <laughs> uh, and let this panel um, discuss their ideas. So um, let me start in the order I believe that's in the program, which would be uh, with Maria, is that correct? So uh, uh, Maria R. Montalvo is Assistant Professor of History at Emory University. She earned her PhD from Rice University in 2018. Her current book project, Enslaved Archives, Slavery Law, and the Production of the Past, is forthcoming with Johns Hopkins University Press. So I will turn it over to you, Maria, um, to deliver your comment. Cool. Hi. Thank you all for uh, having us. Um, I'm only sorry we don't get to do this in person. Uh, but I'm going to ramble a little bit about my work and tell a story and then talk about what I think it tells us about state violence. It shouldn't take more than Five or six minutes. Um, my work is primarily about how enslavers in 19th century New Orleans used paper to commodify enslaved human beings. So I focus on processes like the production, use, and preservation of documents like acts of sale to think not only about the relationship between commodification and archival production, but also how that relationship facilitated violence and shape the lives of enslaved people and our ability to learn about them. Um, so now I'm gonna tell a quick story and then uh, talk about what I think it tells us about state violence. Um, on June 30th, 1819, Betsy and her attorney submit a petition to the Orleans Parish Court. And in her petition, Betsy ushers in a freedom suit that centers on what she says is a case of mistaken identity. Uh, she identifies herself as Betsy, otherwise called Rachel, a free woman of color now in New Orleans, and she argues that she is in fact not an enslaved woman named Rachel, who is claimed as property by Pierre St. Amand, the defendant. Uh, she's Betsy, a woman who was born free in Cincinnati, Ohio, had lived as a free woman in Ohio and Tennessee, worked on the Mississippi River on board barges as a cook, and was never sold or claimed as a slave until she was sold in Louisiana by a man named Joseph, to a man named Nathaniel, and then finally to Pierre. Uh, she relies on eight witnesses to convince the court that she's entitled to her freedom, at least one of whom knew her as a five-year-old child in Ohio, but she does not present any documentary evidence to support her claim, nor is she able to locate any witnesses who can confirm that she was born in Cincinnati. And while all those who testify on her behalf provide details about her past that suggest that she was who she claimed to be, her inability to secure documentary evidence ultimately renders her freedom unverifiable in the eyes of the court. Um, Pierre, the defendant who buys uh, Betsy as Rachel just over a month before she files her lawsuit and likely knows very little in the way of her personal history, calls on four witnesses to testify on his behalf as well as submits two notarial contracts, a private act of sale, and a mortgage certificate. Um, each of these documents, which include the name of an enslaved woman named Rachel, um, and Pierre doesn't have all the aforementioned documents on hand. He's able to secure most of them because they were records he created and archived with the city of New Orleans. Um, in his lengthy written decision, the judge describes the lawsuit as an intricate and troubling case. And what, seemed, what troubles him the most is that the case depended, quote, on one side upon mere testimony, which far from being constantly both positive and concordant, is besides wholly unsupported by any written document whatsoever, uh, end quote. And on April 25th, 1820, he issues a verdict in favor of the defendant rendering Betsy Rachel and enslaved. 
Uh, now, what Pierre Saint Amand did and did not know about the person he claimed at his property did not matter. What mattered was his ability to create and preserve contracts, which those in power considered legitimate evidence of enslavement. Uh, he, used acts of, he uses acts of sale and the city of New Orleans' archives to transform a pre free person of color into an enslaved person. Uh, he used paper to make Rachel and Betsy interchangeable and to render Betsy's freedom illegible. Uh, now, Betsy versus St. Amand is one of 62 freedom suits brought before the Orleans Parish Court between 1813 and 1846. And just to put that in a little bit of context, in those years, there were 17,006 civil suits brought before the court, but only 62 of those are freedom suits. Uh, now, in Louisiana, enslaved people were not allowed to petition the state's courts unless they are suing for their freedom. When they did, they sought attorneys, they filed lawsuits on the basis that they were entitled to their freedom uh, by virtue of their place of birth, ancestry, self-purchase, the consents of an owner's will, a previous act of emancipation, or because they had traveled with their owner's consent to a state where, free, where slavery was illegal. Now, that doesn't mean that every individual who was illegally enslaved was able to sue for their freedom, only that it was possible in Louisiana, at least until 1857. Uh, and records from these lawsuits include, typically include petitions and motions from attorneys, testimony and evidence in the court's decision. And together, these sets of documents typically offer two distinct histories of the plaintiff. The first, the defendants, a history of an enslaved person. And the second, the plaintiffs, a history of a person who was enslaved, but was entitled to their freedom by virtue of something in the past. And when you look at the evidence that enslavers and enslaved people were able to gather in these disputes, you start to see the same disparity you see when you look at Betsy's lawsuit. Uh, first, whereas enslavers consistently present acts of sale that they created, um, an enslaved person typically relies on testimonial evidence. And second, whereas the evidence an enslaver presents typically only extends to a previous sale, usually in the very recent past, an enslaved person's case stretches years, sometimes decades, into a person's past. Um, I argue that the reasons for these discrepancies are rooted in enslavers' privileged archival relationship with the state. Uh, because while enslavers can produce evidence of enslavement at will, evidence of freedom was more difficult to create. Uh, so in linking the enslavement of free people of color with the production of an act of sale, my work forces us to rethink not only the insidiousness of North America's largest slave market, but also the relationship between enslavers, archival production, and state-supported violence, which I think means when we talk about violence, we shouldn't just be talking about crime statistics or murder rates, which are numbers produced by those in power, but also acknowledge and interrogate other forms of violence that shape and constrain the lives of members of marginalized groups, not unlike Betsy. Uh, and I've already talked for too long. So thank you all for listening. I look forward to talking. Great, thank you, Maria. Yay, clapping hands. Okay, uh, so next we go to John Bardis. Um, I just had a tutorial on how to pronounce his name this morning. Um, an assistant professor of history at Louisiana State University. He earned his PhD at Tulane in 2020. His work has appeared in the Journal of Southern History and American Quarterly. His current book project is the history of state coercion in New Orleans entitled Carceral Slave State. Race, Punishment, and Labor in New Orleans, 1803 to 1970. So John. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about this, this book project, Carceral Slave State, and I'm going to show you uh, a few images as well. If you'll bear with me just for a second. Uh -oh. Excuse me, I'm so sorry, there we are. So uh, this project, as, as Molly just said, explores state coercion in New Orleans through police and prisons from the Louisiana Purchase up to the rise of mass incarceration in the 1970s. Uh, we've operated under the assumption for a long time that emancipation precipitated a revolution in the way that the, the, the Southern state coerced labor, and that this is in part because slavery tended to stymie prison development. And so what I argue in this project is that uh, in parts of the antebellum South, and especially in cities, 
free and enslaved people were actually incarcerated at astronomical rates. And authorities built massive slave prisons and devised specialized slave penal systems uh, to maintain control and to maximize profit. So to, so to put this into, into some kind of in some hard numbers to this, uh, for, since the 1970s, New Orleans has generally had the highest incarceration rate of any city in the country. The antebellum incarceration rate among enslaved people was actually higher than the incarceration rate among uh, Black Americans, either in New Orleans or in the nation today. Moreover, many of the coercive strategies and even the two slave prisons you see here actually survived emancipation uh, as institutions repurposed for the coercion of, of wage workers and remained in use well into the 20th century. In other words, emancipation wasn't this complete revolution in state coercive power, I argue, that origins of Jim Crow lie in these antebellum uh, coercive projects and in antebellum slave prisons. Uh, so I begin this book with looking at the creation of New Orleans' first slave workhouse and first police department, both of which were created in one week in May 1805, in response in part to the revolution in Saint-Domingue. Uh, authorities perceived that Louisiana was on, a ver on the verge of a revolution and that the state needed to assume responsibility for uh, disciplining and punishing resistant enslaved people. And that through prisons, fu fugitive and resistant enslaved people could be transformed into idealized slaves, into, these, into submissive servants. Uh, the incarceration rate in antebellum New Orleans very quickly grew incredibly high. Uh, just to spit some statistics at you, by 1830, about 1% to 2% of the enslaved population of New Orleans was in jail at any given moment. Slave penal labor also became vital to the growth of New Orleans. Uh, this image from 1821 shows one of the city's slave chain gangs. On any given day, anywhere between 50 and 120 enslaved penal laborers worked the streets. Uh, they collected trash, they built levees, they built wharves, they built bridges, canals, they paved the streets, uh, scrubbed marketplaces, cleaned public parks, uh, removed trash from gutters and sewers, removed dead pack animals, they operated the city's ambulance service. In other words, their hands were all over every corner and every aspect of the city. Uh, and the same was true for other cities in the Mississippi River Valley, and they often copied uh, or used as a model uh, the slave penal systems developed in New Orleans. And this, this is true for Baton Rouge, Natchez, Vicksburg, Nashville, Louisville, Richmond, and several smaller towns. Uh, and in these cities, it was slave penal labor that built, maintained, and repaired the, the public infrastructure that made economic expansion possible. I also talk about the penal labor systems that New Orleans developed for migratory, migratory poor white workers and for free black sailors and travelers. Uh, so looking at these two other projects form the middle of this book, again, arrest rates among, the, among these populations were astronomically high, far higher than anything in the North at the time. Uh, the broader point here is that Louisiana slaveholders firmly believed that the state had, the, had a vital role to play in the coercion of any lab of all menial laborers that appear dangerously autonomous, uh, whether white or black, whether free and enslaved. So many of these coercive systems actually survived emancipation and would provide the blueprint for labor coercion in their cities during Jim Crow. Uh, New Orleans, for example, transformed its former slave workhouse into a workhouse for the punishment of wage workers convicted of vagrancy. This former slave workhouse remained in use until 1904, uh, whereas it had previously deployed chain gangs of captured fugitive slaves, now it deployed chain gangs of vagrant wage workers. It was rebuilt, replaced by this building, which was in turn replaced by this building, which was in turn replaced by this building. And this building actually stands to this day, although it was abandoned in 2012, uh, throughout the latter half of the 20th century, the Bureau of Justice repeatedly identified this jail as the single worst in the nation. Uh, and I, I had uh, the um, rare opportunity to go inside it recently. There were some pictures I took. 
So I argue that emancipation didn't provoke the complete revolution in coercive state power that we have typically imagined. That in cities, penal labor systems developed for enslaved laborers were adapted quite readily for the coercion of wage workers. And some of those systems remained in use well into the 20th and even into the 21st century. Uh, at the same time, I'm not, I don't think that what we see in New Orleans is a case of kind of this narrowly defined continuity that uh, this project really tries to emphasize the adaptation of these coercive systems, that New Orleans was continuously refining these, these coercive tools at, at the city's disposal, whether that be in response to the, the ways that workers resisted state violence or in response to changes like emancipation, reconstruction, the rise of Jim Crow, or the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Uh, so that's the, that's kind of that a bird's eye overview of the scope of the project. Um, so I'm eager to hear, you know, your questions and, and, and see how these projects engage. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Okay. Um, next up, we have Stephen Prince, Associate Professor of History at the University of South Florida. He earned his PhD at Yale in 2010. He's the author of Stories of the South, Race, and the Reconstruction of Southern Identity, 1865 to 1915, um, published by UNC in 2014. And most recently, The Ballad of Robert Charles, Searching for the New Orleans Riot of 1900, UNC Press 2021. Thank you, Molly. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for, for coming. I obviously wish we could be together in New Orleans, really the whole purpose of this panel was to get together in New Orleans to talk about New Orleans, but you know, I'll take what I can get. Uh, it's, it's good to be with friends and colleagues anyway. Um, so I'm going to talk pretty briefly today. Uh, I'll start with a brief description of the event itself. I'll be talking about my recent book on uh, Robert Charles and the 1900 New Orleans riot. I'll start with a brief description of the event and then end with some reflections on New Orleans and New Orleans history. Um, so at around 11 p.m. on Monday, July 23rd, 1900, two black men, 34-year-old Robert Charles and his 19-year-old roommate Leonard Pierce, sat on a stoop at 2815 Dryad Street in an uptown area of New Orleans, today known as Central City. Three members of the New Orleans Police Department approached. Words were exchanged, and Robert Charles began to struggle with one of the officers. Charles and the officer both threw guns and exchanged fire, both men were wounded and Robert Charles fled into the night. Several hours later, police tracked Charles to his rented room nearby. As they approached his door, Robert Charles opened fire with a Winchester rifle, killing two police officers. Before the police could regroup, Charles escaped once more. With Charles in hiding, white residents of New Orleans would turn on innocent African-Americans. On Wednesday, July 25th, a white mob gathered and began to target black residents. Three African-Americans were killed or mortally wounded on the first night of rioting. Many more were injured. Through it all, the New Orleans Police Department did next to nothing. After Mayor Paul Capdeville deputized an emergency civilian police force uh, the next day, some semblance of order returned to the city streets, but the following night, more acts of violence occurred, including the murder of a black woman in her own home. On Friday, July 27th, the New Orleans Police Department finally located Robert Charles. On the basis of an anonymous tip, two officers went to explore a house at 1208 Saratoga Street. When they entered a small outbuilding in the backyard, Robert Charles burst from his hiding place. He shot the two officers and then retreated to the second floor of the building. As word of the shooting spread, a heavily armed crowd gathered. Over the next several hours, Robert Charles killed three members of the crowd and wounded several more. Desperate city authorities finally approved a plan to set the uh, hideout on fire, and Charles was shot and killed as he emerged from the burning building. During the last week of his life, Robert Charles killed seven white people, including four members of the New Orleans Police Department. According to the uh, tallies published in the city's newspapers and provided by the NOPD, white mobs murdered six African Americans, it's seven if we include Charles himself, and wounded dozens more. It is entirely possible, uh, I would say quite likely, that there were additional black fatalities, but incomplete police and hospital records make it impossible to know for certain. 
So that's the basic outline uh, of the event itself that I've, I've written about. And I'd be happy to talk more about my approach to describing it and the intellectual flame frameworks that I, I deployed uh, in, in describing it. But given that the subject of our panel is, is New Orleans history and rethinking New Orleans history, uh, I thought a few words about New Orleans history would be uh, in order here. And I really don't wanna get into a diatribe against New Orleans exceptionalism so early in the morning. Um, but I do want to close with some thoughts uh, on the ways that New Orleans functions in my work, both as a setting and as a subject. Um, so it goes without saying that my book, like any history book, engages with its setting, right? So more specifically, I took great pains to recreate the physical and cultural geography of Robert Charles's New Orleans. Today, the area in which Charles lived and died is known as Central City, uh, but in 1900, it was simply called the back of town. Uh, located near the edge of the city's back swamps, the area was home to a large population of working class African Americans and a slightly smaller population of immigrant whites. Each year, thousands of black migrants from agricultural parts of the South made their way to the city in search of work and a better life. Robert Charles himself was a Mississippi native who had arrived in New Orleans in 1894. So without an awareness of the history of this place, the back of town and the people who called it home, we can't make sense of, of Robert Charles and his experiences uh, and his, his revolt. So in this sense, this is resolutely a New Orleans story, one that is deeply tied to the social, economic, and demographic realities of the turn of the century city. But uh, the book also tells a larger story, or hopefully several. Um, so rather than a creature of a unique and wholly distinctive New Orleans, I'd suggest that the 1900 riot is best understood as a reflection of a regional and national project that is the reconfiguration of race in the violent crucible of turn of the century white supremacy. So New Orleans is of course well known for the persistence of its tripartite racial order, black, white, and Creole, which unsettled binary notions of black and white throughout the 19th century. But the Robert Charles riot was a strictly black and white affair. The linguistic and cultural boundaries that had long divided the city's African-American community held absolutely no significance for the white rioters in July, 1900. Though there is no evidence that Robert Charles had any significant connections with the city's Afro-Creole community, white mobs stalked and targeted black residents in traditional Creole areas of town, targeting victims with little regard for heritage or language. So in violence, racial difference was made real. On this level, I would argue New Orleans proved anything but exceptional. Indeed, in this period of time, it was all too typical. So I will, I will stop there for the time being. Uh, thanks to my co-panelists and to the SHA, and I'm looking forward to, to a good discussion. Great. Thank you so much. Um, last but not least, uh, Nikki Brown is Associate Professor of History at the University of Kentucky. Um, her book, Private Politics and Public Voices, Black Women's Activism from World War I to the New Deal, won the Letitia Ward Woods Brown Award for Best Book in African American Women's History in 2006. Dr. Brown is also a professional photographer and is, has recently completed a photography project on African American men in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. She's currently working on a book about Louisiana's civil rights movement she travels often to Turkey, where she was a Fulbright lecturer and is working on an oral history of the Afro-Turks, the African descendants of slaves in the Ottoman Empire. So, Nikki. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Thanks so much. I, I really, um, uh, this is, this. there's so many great threads already that have been laid down. You're muted. So, oh, am I? No, because it says that I'm not. Uh, says, Steve, oh, you pushed the... We have the po uh, power of muting other speakers too, so you may have muted Nikki, but she's not muted. Okay, okay, oh, okay. My bad, you're good now, apologies. Okay, okay. So, uh, well, no, thanks, thanks. Um, this is that focuses on Louisiana. Um, uh, basically, it just came from this one question that I had when I was um, living in Louisiana, and I had met uh, 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 Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Prince, um, and uh, and that was uh, why was Louisiana underrepresented in the in the um, catalog of civil rights photography? And and I basically just wanted to write a book that answered that question. Uh, that the catalog is basically 
or another way to, to pose the question is that the catalog of civil rights photography is dominated by two states and that's Mississippi and Alabama. And, but I thought that there's such a rich history of civil rights activism in Louisiana that I thought that I would sort of, uh, that I would try to explore that. And so through the course of this, of uh, researching and writing this book, I think I, I've come up with maybe uh, at least five different photographers and five different, I think, photographic gazes of Louisiana, which, uh, uh, which speak to this issue of, of why Louisiana is so complex and so nuanced. And so I'll just give you the five photographers that I'm working on and, and the decades that I'm working on. And then I'll try to answer the question, why, why is Louisiana underrepresented? So, uh, so to the photographers, uh, for the 1890s and 1910s, um, the photographer is Arthur Badu, who did a lot of work of uh, uh, socialites, uh, Creole socialites uh, at Xavier University. Um, and then for the 1930s, I look at two uh, f uh, sets of photographers, uh, Horace Mann Bond, who's mostly known as an educator, an African-American educator, but he also spent a few years in Louisiana uh, photographing schools for the Rosenwald Fund. And the other group is uh, the, uh, the uh, FSA photographers, the photographers for the Farm Security Administration that produced Dorothy Lang and Margaret Burke White and Walker Evans. But they also uh, produced two photographers, uh, Russell Lee and Marion Post Wolcott, who spent a significant time in Louisiana uh, photographing for the federal government. Uh, for the 1960s, I'm, I'm looking at the photographs of the Congress of Racial Equality, who uh, went into Southern Louisiana to work on uh, farming cooperatives. Uh, for the 1970s, I'm looking at the uh, I'm looking at the work of Tom Dent and uh, and um, and the and the Southern Theater, but I'm also looking at the looking at the work of Harold Baquet, who worked for the um, New Orleans Times Picayune, uh, and, and he had a lot of other side projects. And finally, the for the for for 2005 for the first century of the 21st century, I'm looking at the photographs by the Dallas Morning News of Hurricane Katrina. So, largely speaking, or broadly speaking, the um, the project is about sort of uh, picturing is called tentatively picturing the African American freedom struggle in Louisiana from 1890 to 2005, uh, or from her Homer Plessy to Hurricane Katrina. And uh, and looking at those five or several photographers and the gazes that they bring to the complexity of race and racism in Louisiana. So that's 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 basically that's basically the book. Um, but I wanted to get back to that big question of, um, you know, why is Louisiana left out? And I think I have five different answers. I've given to to this question. So so first and foremost, um, when it comes to representations of of uh, civil rights struggle in American popular media, uh, uh, the the images tend to focus on extreme violence, and, and you know, and that's just nothing new. That you know, that violence leads, or if it bleeds, it leads. Um, and and so the two states that uh, represent the extremes in civil rights violence is uh, Mississippi and Alabama. So, and, and violence is just so extreme that we can, all, without even thinking about it, come up with all of the different uh, um, uh, uh, actors in the violence. We have the white sheriff and the white police officers and the dogs and the civil rights protesters. Um, and, and those images kind of dominate the American imagination. Um, but that's what, what, what we have to say, that, that those are the extremes, you know, so it's almost like the extremes becomes the archetype. But in reality, um, that the, the other states and the way that they engage civil rights, the movement, um, that is, um, it's much more nuanced. So that's the first issue. Uh, the first answer is that for American popular media, the focus is on extreme violence. But secondly, um, when you, when you move past those extreme depictions, uh, you, uh, you have to look into things like demographics and, and demographics and, re and representation and states like Louisiana offer a great deal of nuance. So that's my second point is that Louisiana is almost so nuanced that it's, that it's difficult to break down into, um, into single elements. Uh, thirdly, 
uh, the nuances that Louisiana does offer, um, I think are, are very difficult to translate, I think, to American, a broad American audience that wants sort of things in simple bites. Um, but I like, as, I, as I've written this book, I've, I found that, um, that I think I said this earlier, that demographics affects representation, that demographics are representation. So um, I focus on Louisiana, not just New Orleans, because New Orleans has its own sort of racial demographics. But then there's across the space, state, you have the rural uh, uh, areas of, of northern and eastern Louisiana, uh, 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 in contrast to urban areas like Shreveport and Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Um, and then there are the southern, there's the southern parts of Louisiana that border the Gulf South. Uh, there's no sort of unified uh, African American experience um, in Louisiana because different parts of the state experience different racial oppression differently, um, and so and with that they have different uh, civil rights visual culture. So so that's what I was trying to get to. Uh, so that's fourth fourth that me to fourth fourth point, which is that I think the reason why Louisiana often gets left out of the civil rights of the civil rights catalog is that is that the focus tends is that American popular media just seizes on one moment, and that is the New Orleans school crisis of 1960, and it seizes on one girl, uh, Ruby Bridges, and again leaves out the nuances. We all know from our re research here that the school crisis wasn't just one year or one month. Uh, it wasn't just one girl. It was something that took place over 12 years, and it took place over. With, and it started with four girls. So we know that that's uh, nuanced. But again, it's 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 too complex. Um, uh, it was too complex at that time to break down for for I think a larger American audience. Um, so it's in many ways it was easier to sort of go to images of children or church burnings or church bombings or children being bitten by dogs than looking at like sort of specific in individuals in New Orleans and how they're having different experiences. And, and finally, I think the fifth point I would make as to why Louisiana is often left out of the civil rights narrative is that I think that the movement is still going on. That, that again, by focusing on Mississippi and in Alabama, um, it, we want to have sort of a bookends. We want to have this, this narrative that fits into one decade. But what Hurricane Katrina has shown is that the civil rights movement extended into the 21st century. And maybe we're still in it. I think that maybe we are still in it. But it's something that, um, that, 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 that the movement itself never really ended. Um, and if, if there's one thing that Hurricane Katrina showed, it's that um, these racial and economic inequalities um, uh, not only persist, but they, but they, are, they have deadly consequences. Um, as deadly as they uh, had in the uh, 1960s or earlier. So, so I think it's those five reasons that have worked together to keep Louisiana. I'm not well to to um, uh, those five reasons. I think are working against a larger uh, a portrait of Louisiana, and that's what my book is trying to do: is to try to make that space for Louisiana uh, uh, by looking through these different for these five different photographers. So that's it. That's my um, that's my uh, project, and I, I I move and I look forward to a really exciting discussion. Fantastic, thank you, Nikki. Um, so uh, I'm I'm gonna um, ask the first question, but while I do that, I'm gonna um, encourage our uh, lovely audience that I cannot see, um, but I can quantify. Um, if you could put your questions in the chat so that I can relay those. Um, to the to the panelists as they come in, but um, I would like to uh, start with this question. Jumping off of exceptionalism, uh, uh, as someone who has to teach New Orleans a lot, <laughs> I often start with this question, um, particularly with my graduate students, in terms of um, how and why New Orleans has been treated as exceptional over time. Um, I am old enough to remember reading, you know, uh, in the introduction to scholars books that, oh, yes, this is a study of the South, but I'm leaving New Orleans out because it just doesn't fit. Right. <laughs> so um, but I so but it sounds like to me so much of each of your projects um, touches on the opposite or another approach at the very least, which is 
actually New Orleans is in the vanguard and it's always been in the vanguard on some level um, uh, in US history. And so I'm wondering if you could reflect on that as it relates to your own project where you see, um, where you perhaps see New Orleans um, in the vanguard um, of a larger national um, development and, and changes over time. And just open the floor, I guess, unless you want to raise your hand. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I in I see New Orleans as a critical innovator in penal technologies and in, in the history of the prison that should be acknowledged up there with Philadelphia, New York City, Paris, London. Um, and, and to your point, I see it as a as a vanguard, but not an exceptional case. That things that are being developed, things that were being developed in Antebellum New Orleans, were then being dispersed throughout the South. Um, you know, to take the chain gang itself as an example, uh, in this book, one of the things I explore is where they get this idea of using chain gangs to punish captured fugitive slaves from, and they actually import it from uh, a previous, they, they replicate a previous penal practice that had been underway in San Domingue, uh, and import that into, that, that penal practice is brought to New Orleans with refugees from San Domingue and from New Orleans other cities throughout the Mississippi River Valley copy that punishment strategy, both as a way to uh, create whiteness and blackness through public humiliation of bodies, but also as a way of deploying penal laborers. Uh, so I think that, I mean, that, that really kind of, for me, that's really critical, right? That New Orleans isn't exceptional. New Orleans is a gateway through which ideas and goods and people are flowing from the Caribbean and from Europe and from the Northeast and then being dispersed through the Mississippi River and through other channels throughout the South. You know, that, I mean, as you said, a vanguard, not an exceptionality. Um, that's at least how I, that's at least how I, how I configure those puzzle pieces in my work. But uh, you're Nikki, you're breaking up a little bit. Okay, okay. Can you We're not getting, we're not getting you. We can't, we can't, yeah. Uh, no, we can't get, um, but, but, but let's go to someone else. Nikki, maybe put some ideas in the chat and, and, then we can maybe try to circle back. <laughs> it's so terrible. I'm so sorry. Um, somebody else want to take a stab at this, Maria or Stephen? Yeah, I'll go. Um, so when people study slavery in the Antebellum United States, I think they tend to look through New Orleans. Uh, and it's not just because it was the largest slave market in North America. It's because that's where records are. Um, but the, but I, I think that comes with issues because we haven't yet done the work of, you know, I'm trying to do the work of thinking about why records were preserved in New Orleans the way they were. And I think uh, looking at that process tells us something about power in the world as it then was and what, what it means now. Uh, but um, when I was on the job market, one question you always get is, uh, why New Orleans? Uh, and is this just a story about New Orleans? And I, I like to reference Rashana Johnson's book, uh, who who says New Orleans is an exception. It's a mirror. Uh, you hold it up and you can see the rest of the country and sometimes the rest of the Atlantic world. Um, so uh, I think, uh, you know, acknowledging that, you know, it's 
it's unique in terms of the ways these records were produced and preserved, but also it can tell us something broader about the world as it then was. Uh, that's that's kind of how I understand it. Still cutting up. Stephen, could you want to weigh in or while we're waiting yeah, on Nikki? Then? Nikki, we're hearing like every fourth syllable. That's that's all. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, I've, I've certainly, I think, you know, Maria's uh, uh, "Why New Orleans?" question is is quite quite apt, and you know, the, the way I describe it in the book is, you know, I've gotten while giving talks or whatever, yeah, you know, yeah, but it's New Orleans, so that's like okay. Um, so I mean, part of what I what I sort of tried to do is, on the one hand, I think I think the Robert Charles affair could have happened anywhere in the South, anywhere in the United States. And as a matter of fact, there were, you know, violent uh, altercations between African Americans and the police in New York and in Akron, Ohio, that very same summer um, of 1900. So, you know, and it, it is it is not just a New Orleans event. It is not just a, a Southern event. You know, I think I think this the event could have occurred in, in Atlanta or Mobile or, you know, Washington, D.C. or take your pick. But on the other hand, you know, I, I think it is it is very locally specific. And, you know, a lot of my argument about the causes of the violence, both from the perspective of Robert Charles and also from the perspective of, of the members of, of the white mobs who were, were hunting and, and killing African-Americans. A lot of my argument has to do with, you know, the, the, the sort of granular ground level neighborhood conflicts over space and access and visibility and control. And I argue that it is, you know, um, quite literally, the city is not just the setting for this violence, but the city is 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 the prize. It's what's being contested and, and struggled over. Um, and so, I mean, that's the, that's the the challenge with this sort of, you know, New Orleans exceptionalism question for me, because it has to be New Orleans on the one hand, because, you know, there that's the territory that's being contested. But on the other hand, such struggles over public space are clearly not unique to to the city of New Orleans. So, I mean, that that's sort of my my back and forth on it. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the Vanguard comment, Molly, and that's really interesting. And I I certainly see it in John's work and Maria's. And I'm I'm I'm, I'm taking a pause on that. I, I don't know if this violence is really in the vanguard as you know, as much as it is of a piece with this sort of massive wave of uh, systematic racial terror that you know dominates the 1890s and and the first decade of of the 20th century. So I don't I don't know if New Orleans is leading the way, but it is certainly you know right in there. So I guess I'll leave that there. At the very least, it puts it in the national picture and keeps from excluding it, right? It's, Absolutely. I would also add, written, yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Talk. Oh, sorry. No, I would also add that I think, you know, thinking about Nikki's work and thinking to see about your work, that we have, to, it's, it's worth acknowledging that these ideas about American exception, about New Orleans exceptionalism also, you know, ultimately come from the way that New Orleans has historically served as a place for other for white Americans writ large to kind of to enact racial fantasies and explore racial fascinations and and particularly a place for the fetishization I think of of black women in New Orleans as as, as this as New Orleans being a place where racial boundaries could be crossed right and then that that those narratives getting kind of amplified by tourism narratives especially in the latter half of the nineteenth and the twentieth century. So I think, you know, in part of what our work is doing, uh, Nikki's work, and I, and I think Steve, your work too, is challenging this idea of, is, is contributing to this broader effort to kind of rethink this tripartite racial order that, you know, used to really define the way that historians thought about race in New Orleans. And I think a lot of people are now starting to poke, poke holes in from different directions, right? How, in what ways is, the racial dynamic and the racial mores that govern New Orleans, in what ways is it less exceptional than we have, than people have previously thought, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nikki has logged out, she's trying to come back. 
to get her. So we don't have her comment yet, but um, so maybe we'll, we'll just we'll just keep going and see if she if she returns. But um, just jumping off of what you said, John, one of the questions that the group had thought about in preparation for the roundtable was this question of you know the the, the image of New Orleans as the sort of racially fluid place versus the image of New Orleans as this sort of authentic um, home of authentic uh, African American culture or blackness. Um, and so maybe we could talk a bit about how you feel like your work, each of you, um, in, intersects with those two different um, notions, really, about, about the city that, are, that, that go beyond academia, uh, but include academia. Yeah. Um, can you hear me now? I'm going to try. I've tried. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. I, I closed the browser and then I came back in. Uh, but I, I, I really like your question, Dr. Mitchell, <laughs> and I think I can really, um, and I really like what, what people said, particularly what Dr. Montalvo said about uh, New Orleans isn't uh, an exception, it's a mirror. Uh, what I wanted to say that I, in, in the previous question, but I think relates to this question, is that I believe the first major civil rights catastrophe of the 21st century was Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. Um, and 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 we and the things that we sort of attach to uh, the movement today in terms of I can't breathe or um, uh, please help us, uh, we see that in Hurricane Katrina just as we saw that in George Floyd's murder um, and Breonna Taylor and, and Ahmaud Arbery. And I think that that's how we can connect New Orleans to sort of or the history or the racial politics of New Orleans um, or the civil rights activism of New Orleans to uh, to to the nation around us is that we see these sparks and we see these seeds or in, in the case of Katrina it wasn't a seed it was a it was it was right there in front of us uh, for our eyes but um, but because people said, well, it's Louisiana or it's it's a poor state or it's New Orleans it's not really important but that's the point because it was happening to the poor black people, eventually it's gonna to happen to the rest of the country. Um, so you have to pay attention to what's happening to poor black people um, because that gives you a roadmap as to what's gonna happen with the rest of the country. And that really speaks to, to Dr. Bardis's work and Dr. Prince's work. When we talk about incarceration, what happened to poor black people, enslaved people will happen across the country. And what happened uh, in a race riot led by a man who was a Pan-Africanist in 1900 will lead to, 20 years later, uh, something in New York uh, with Marcus Garvey, uh, who, was, who also was deported from New Orleans. So, so it just seems like New Orleans pops up um, all uh, th throughout 20th century civil rights in African-American history. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so could we maybe talk about that a bit? Does, does New Orleans, demand that we sort of rethink the history of civil rights, um, or at least the, the, the way in which we write about it. Was that a question for me or a question for everyone? Anyway, it's a round table. <laughs> it doesn't look like a round table. It's round. Oh. Well, I, I'll, I'll, again, um, I'm going to capitalize on the good internet for 10 seconds and just say that if there's one thing that I find so interesting that's left out of the Plessy des decision, the Plessy versus Ferguson decision of 1896, is how um, whiteness was described as property uh, by uh, Homer Plessy's um, uh, lawyers, uh, Albion Turgy. He said that, you know, if you deprive this, this black man or this man, who is seven eighths white of his whiteness, then you are depriving him an opportunity to uh, to rise up in the world. You're depriving him political rights and 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 economic rights and so forth. And I think that that idea that whiteness is as property, as whiteness has value, we most certainly have explored that throughout the 20th century. But it really is this key aspect, I think, of civil rights discourse, which is how much is whiteness worth and how much is blackness worth? I mean, is, and, and, and is, is valuing whiteness as property uh, a key aspect of white supremacy? And actually, I'm going to put that in an affirmative statement and say that valuing whiteness, uh, putting an economic 
uh, figure, the dollar figure on whiteness is a key aspect of white supremacy. Uh, uh, and the, and the continual, continual uh, uh, making African Americans and other people of color inferior. Um, so I, th I think that that's a, it's a very interesting and I think a, a very compelling legal argument that, that brings us into the 21st century. Yeah, really interesting to have maybe run up for some, uh, particularly with your focus on, on the legal record. Molly, Molly I don't think we can hear you anymore. You've, uh, you're having the same problem you were having a second ago. So you may need to, to, to no, you know, to reset. You're all chopped up for me. You know, okay. it's, it's the strength of the you know, it's you know the strength of our argument is so strong. We're we're, we're really what we're doing is we're, is we're speaking truth to power, and the internet can't handle it. It can't handle it. How am I doing? Do I sound okay? Obviously, there's not much truth coming from uh, from my end of the internet, but that's okay. Um, Speaking to, to the question that Molly asked uh, before before Nikki came back, um, and maybe tying into Nikki's comments a little bit, um, one of the one of the main notions that I play with in in writing about the the, the nineteen hundred violence is is the idea of, of visibility and invisibility. Um, and nineteen hundred is such a fascinating moment in uh, in New Orleans history and Southern history. I'm biased, obviously, but. Um, this moment of of sort of transition, um, the the sort of city fathers of New Orleans, the white city fathers, having, you know, beaten back uh, the threat of of reconstruction, are sort of attempting to, by their bootstraps, sort of lift the city back into the to the top echelon of of American cities and sort of recapture some sense of their, you know, the New Orleans is antebellum glory days uh, from their perspective. Um, and in so doing, they're they're desperate to sort of tell the story of New Orleans as a white city. Uh, it is it is a it is a white city. It has always been a white city. But on the other hand, they are wholly reliant on the labor of African Americans in in the back of town and other um, portions of of the city to do the work that is going to allow New Orleans to become this thing that uh, the white elites are are imagining it's going to be. And there's this binds because on the one hand, you know, it's a complete reliance on this population, but an inability to admit that reliance or even look at it or even you know speak its name um and so i argue that that a, a sort of stylized selective invisibility is is sort of um part and parcel of of the project of jim crow in new orleans that there are certain populations and certain sections of town that are sort of rendered invisible uh to to white elites and are sort of disavowed are left off the map if you will um and I mean, I, I think it's, you know, that's an that's a different way to think about the sort of history of, of race relations in, in New Orleans. This is this is not um, the the sort of um, the, the the sense of openness. This is this is something very different that is happening in the in the sort of Jim Crow moment um, and an unwillingness to, to see and recognize uh, this population. So from that perspective, you know, Robert Charles creates an epistemological crisis for for white elites in the city it's not just a not just a, a political crisis or or a crisis of violence but it's seriously like an intellectual who is this man where did he come from you know um and i, I think that that's a large part of of the response so that's that's one perspective um i also treat the, the issue of memory in the book quite a bit and i think once you start looking uh you know, New Orleans, I think we would all agree, is a city that is quite obsessed with its own history, for better or for worse. And I think a large part of what makes New Orleans New Orleans is this hyper awareness of of its history. That late Reconstruction to early 20th century period, the Jim Crow moment uh, for most of the 20th century, at least, is just elided. It's just not part of of the history that white New Orleanians, at least, tell themselves about themselves. Um, and, you know, and I mean, it doesn't fit into the sort of more, you know, familiar narratives of, of the city. And Robert Charles in particular has is is completely sort of whitewashed in, in all of those 20th century popular histories and, and white memories of the city. Um, African-American memory definitely keeps him alive. And I read about that quite a bit. Um, 
So I think I think this event and this time period in particular, the the Jim Crow moment in New Orleans, you know, the the dawn of Jim Crow sort of troubles uh, a lot of the easy stereotypes that we have about the city. Um, and for that reason, I think it 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 doesn't factor into to you know a lot of of popular discussions of of New Orleans and New Orleans history. Can you hear me now? Oh, I'm back. Yes. Okay. I hope I, I didn't miss too much. <laughs> um, so, but on that, that theme of, of um, public memory, of course, currently New Orleans is, is, um, is doing a lot um, in several quarters to try to address silences and, and sort of public memory, particularly there's a new, relatively new Robert Charles marker, right? I don't know if you mentioned that when I was buzzed out. Okay. Um, so I, I'm curious as to what you all think about, you know, the dis, the obvious disparity between how New Orleans is presented um, often in, uh, in tourist um, facing <laughs> uh public history uh, versus you know the, the 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 public history or the history that you are all studying how is that gap in the public memory addressed um how can historians help to address that um and put more of those stories that are not stereotypical um out there do markers work is there are there other ways are there other ideas you have Particularly, Nikki, I'm thinking of you. Sort of, you're trying to insert the uh, Louisiana into a larger sort of framework um, where it's not it's not there. Um, but I think it, you know, some way applies to all of your work in that way. You're cutting out again. Uh, can someone else take a pass while Nikki resets? I mean, for, uh, you know, one of the, I'll just say briefly, like the, the complicating wrinkle in this is that the city's economy relies so deeply on tourism. And so much of that tourism economy is reliant on selling a certain image of New Orleans as this, again, as this racially lax place where white Americans can experience a certain, can cross certain racial boundaries and, and white and black Americans can encounter some sort of authentic blackness, right? And troubling that narrative to a certain degree is to trouble an economy that the city is very, very dependent on. Um, Yes, Nikki is talking about Linnell Thomas's um, work, Desire and Disaster in New Orleans, which does a fantastic job of of addressing addressing some of this. Um, uh, we also have something in the chat from Karen Leatham at the State Museum. Hi, Karen. Uh, that Stephen's comments about invisibility made her think about that recent marketing campaign that represented tourists and the city as as white, um, which is she gave us the link. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. Um, Oh, if there's only one person is unmuted, it's better chance that that um, we can hear the person speaking. So make sure you mute. Okay. <laughs> um, anything else on this, Maria? I would love to get you in on this conversation. I'm curious, what does for you New Orleans look like from the archive or from the courtroom? If you're really immersed in the records that you're looking at, what what is that? What does that city look like? What does New Orleans look like from the courtroom? I mean, um, you know, uh, a lot of times the main stories that you hear from lawsuits are exceptional, right? Because not everybody's suing each other every day. Um, so if when you're staring at freedom suits in particular, the city starts to look quite dangerous. Um, like Betsy was working. Uh, she was a free woman. Uh, she she regularly uh, went from Baton Rouge to New Orleans and back again. Uh, but, um, you know, a man approaches her on the street one day 
and says, hey, you're Rachel. And that's it. Um, who she was and how she could be perceived in a space in that space made her vulnerable. And I keep thinking, you know, what where would she not have been vulnerable? Um, and, and I can't come up with an answer. Um, so, well, you know, exceptional, but once again, I find myself thinking that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's unique that we, that I can see these kinds of cases from the courtroom that I can know about her experience from this vantage point, because, you know, th this might be a place where Jessica Marie Johnson's concept of no value becomes especially valuable because, you know, I have 62 lawsuits, but there's no way there was only 62 people who had a similar experience. Um, so that's, that's kind of how it looks like to me from where I am. I really, I really like what Dr. Montalvo just said, and I just want to uh, piggyback on it and go back to a question that was asked earlier, and that is that um, if uh, what Dr. Montalvo just said about uh, Rachel and um, and the woman that she really was is a perfect example of the use and abuse of the Fugitive Slave Act um, of eighteen, I think it's eighteen fifty. Right, and, and and how and and so, so the Fugitive Slave Act or the misuse of it uh, uh, is is uh, one of the key aspects of what the abolitionists were saying um, that, that that slavery was was uh, threatening to take over the entire country because if if a, if a black person isn't walking around with their freedom papers, they can be snatched back into slavery at any at any given moment. And I often think that. Um, there, the, one of the ways in which New Orleans is both exception and mirror is to teach the history of slavery through uh, the experience, uh, uh, th through the New Orleans experience and to have actual people say, you know, that the Fugitive Slave Act, for example, w wasn't just this, this, this broad law, but it happened to a specific person or um, the way that New Orleans or the way that Louisiana comes into the union as a slave state illustrates uh, like, like Dr. Mitchell has said ab about the power of uh, the Haitian Revolution and the fear of um, the fear that uh, uh, Napoleon had when um, the, uh, the th that the Haitian Revolution would spread across the French colonies, and that affects the United States as well. You know, like you can tell the history of slavery through the history of Louisiana. Uh, um, um, and I think that you would be able to pick up a, many of the nuances of slavery, as, as well as the the nightmares of slavery, through t through looking at it through Louisiana. So these are these are all different. It, it, uh, and finally, you can tell the history of the civil rights movement through the history of Louisiana, through the history of of New Orleans, uh, again, and pick up all of these really important. Uh, nuances that make it uh, much less about sort of extremes, but much more about uh, a, a, a long process, a long, a long continuing process of civil rights activism. I just want to jump in, and I mean, it's interesting, um, you know, Maria's point about about Betsy, um, and this is more John's territory than mine, but you know. As, as John certainly knows and, and suggested, New Orleans was running on, on convict labor uh, in, in 1900. And as I was trying to think through um, what Robert Charles is thinking when he pulls his gun as the police officers approach him or what that conversation looked like um, on July 23rd, 1900, the fact that African Americans across the city were being were being snatched up, thrown in the police jail on trumped up vagrancy charges, the city passes an extraordinary lead, uh, all-encompassing vagrancy statute in 1898, um, and they're sending hundreds of people out into the streets every day to, to you know, clean thing, clean up the the city streets and markets and et cetera. But it's, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, you know. And I mean, the the it's Betsy's experience and Robert Charles's experience were not the same, and his enslavement or his imprisonment would have only been a week or so. It would not have been a lifetime of of enslavement, clearly. But you know, he was facing sort of that risk of of freedom being taken away for the act of sitting on a, on a street, you know, it's. I guess I can talk about the, the marker too, since Molly brought that up. Um, I think a marker is a really good start. I think it's better than nothing. You know, I'll, I'll say that. And, um, 
you know, I mean, it was a long time in coming. I was, I haven't, I haven't been to New Orleans to actually see the the marker to the to to the nineteen hundred right yet. When I get into town, whenever that is, you know, I think that'll probably be my first stop. Um, and it was a beautiful ceremony, and you know, I I honestly cried a little bit when watching, you know, two young students read the text of the marker and and yell Robert Charles's name into the the morning air. You know, it was pretty amazing. Um, but you know, I was I was peripherally involved in an effort to to place a marker to the 1900 riot in like 2015, which basically Mayor Landrieu's administration was in the process of talking about taking down the Lee statue and the other three statues, and they didn't want to talk about a, a marker to the 1900 riot at that moment. And it's really interesting the way that like the one project to sort of you know reimagine the city's memorial landscape got in the way of this other smaller project to reimagine the city's memorial landscape. Um, but I mean, all credit in the world to the Orleans Legacy Projects. Um, I know John's wife is, is a member and was involved and to the Equal Justice Initiative for getting it done in, in 2020 and, and getting that marker up. Because I think, you know, it's not everything, um, but it's the start. And I'm, I'm struck by the fact that, you know, as far as I know, has any decision been made on on what to do with with Lee Circle? I mean, is it just is it there's just there's still just a big pole, right? And you know, I, I think there's an interesting. We're talking about it. You know, there's a half a mile of, a difference between space between between, you know, um, reading. That's great. What what Karen just said in the chat. Um, I'll stop there. I think it's I think it's fascinating that you know the where once there was Lee and no marker to Robert Charles, now there is no Lee and a marker to Robert Charles, but we still haven't figured out what actually needs to happen with that space at, at, at Lee Circle. Um, I'm curious to see where that goes in, in future years, but. Yeah, well, it, um, the, the latest proposal was um, that would be uh, called Egalite Circle, um, and that it would have a sort of broad thematic reach that could then not necessarily be always dedicated to one person or thing, but would could evolve. But um, of course, <laughs> it, it, uh, it's a tricky one. That, that's a really tough one. Prospect 5 um, is going to have an installation there. Um, I'm not sure what the dates of it are, but you can check their website. I believe they're having an installation in Lee Circle, um, or they talked about that. So it's still, I guess you would say, at play. Um, and I think it's still um sort of a, a testament to projects like the paper monuments project and to take them down nola um that it's still at play right it's it should be contested for a while it shouldn't be just immediately replaced with something else um so i don't know if anybody else has anything to say about that that's just my my little footnote i think you know leaving the space empty actually is intellectually useful in its own sort of way for at least a period of time that that is it is a marker in and of itself, you know, the, the sort of absence of, of older forms of commemoration and, and you know, it, making that discussion, I think, is actually useful and allowing people to, to use that space in different ways. Yeah, I mean, this, this a, part of me thinks that the econ New Orleans' tourism economy is so important that the city will adapt to, will reinvent its kind of racial fantasies to keep that economy going. The hopeful part of me is really excited that once again, New Orleans is this vanguard, right? Where it can rethink what a monument looks like in the 21st century. Nikki? Oh, there's a there's a, a comment by Karen Leatham in the chat that says that there's a Solomon Northrop marker on Esplanade. Um, that is new to me. I left uh, New Orleans in, uh, in September 2019, and I wonder if that went up after I left, or or is that something that yeah uh, can can people speak to that? When when Molly brought up markers, that's the one that I thought of because whenever I go to Esplanade and Frenchman, you see it; it's there. Um, you 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 can't miss it, uh, and I always stop and read it whenever I go back. Uh, but yeah, it's like a heavy trafficked area, and uh, there's always somebody in front of it learning something. To think. Um, the the transatlantic slave trade marker on the riverfront is also another one that went up about the same time as the Northrop marker, all kind of around the tricentennial 
time period, we got these new markers and they are getting a lot of readership, or particularly, you know, because they're high traffic areas. They really are making, I really think they really are making people look at the landscape um, and the space differently, which is, which is great. Um, Michio says there should be more markers about reconstruction in New Orleans, right? I think that's, that is absolutely true. Um, I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about since so much of your work all touches on this question and it's in our title, violence, <laughs> uh, the role of state violence in the city's history, right? What it seems like to me, it takes different forms in your work. And I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about, um, how pointing to the role of state violence is helping to reimagine the city. Okay, fine. Um, yeah, great question. And I mean, I'm, I'm curious to hear John and Maria speak to, to state violence, actually, which is why I wasn't jumping onto this. Um, obviously, there are a bunch of layers of violence sort of tied into to the the story, the Robert Charles story. There's, you know, the lifetime of both spectacular and mundane racial violence that Robert Charles as a black man in the late 19th century South experienced, which provides the sort of, you know, backstory to, to, to his act of violence. There's Charles himself. Um, acting on sort of, you know, the ideology of, of armed self-defense against white supremacist aggression. Um, and then Charles has continued violence, you know, I mean, he ends up killing seven people that week. Um, there's obviously the white mobs that take to the streets, attacking African-Americans at random, none of whom really have anything to do with Robert Charles, and most of whom aren't even where Robert Charles could have possibly been. You know, it very quickly during during a couple of days of, of street violence, it becomes not about Robert Charles at all, and it becomes it becomes violence and punishment and claiming the public space. Um, but I think one of the most interesting ones is actually the mayor uh, ends up deputizing an emergency civilian police force, a sort of uh, upper class militia, if you will. Um, who take to the streets on the Thursday of the riot week and sort of run off both the white rioters and, you know, African-Americans continue to stay out of sight um, as, as best they're able. And I think the sort of forceful reclamation, I mean, that's a form of state violence in and of itself, the forceful reclamation of, of the city streets, the public space on the basis of the city government and, and the white elites who in this case are claiming it from, you know, you have, white rioters who are sort of claiming public space, but then you have the sort of elite whites and the, the city infrastructure who are reclaiming the city from that white mob, amongst other things. Um, so, I mean, it's violence is everywhere in the story. And I think it's, it's coming from it's, 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 I don't, I don't know if layered is the right metaphor or coming from different angles, but I mean, it, it really, wherever you look, violence is, is there and is, is, contested and, and deployed in, in the service of, I think, various types of, of power and, and control, really. Where, where my head goes, you know, I think um, we think of New Orleans as a place where power relationships are constantly being negotiated through these public performances, through Mardi Gras through second lines, through Mardi Gras Indians, through all these dancing in the street, that all these kinds of, there's all these kind of ritualized uh, public performances and spectacles through which people are uh, processing and contesting social relationships in the city and, and the distribution of power in the city. At least that's how I see it and how others have, have reframed it. What I'm really curious about in my work, and I think what ties in all of our projects is this way that these really violent spectacles are critical to the way that these social relationships are enacted and reinforced. You know, from, I mean, not to, not to overstate it or put too fine a point on it, but from 1805 to about 1970, there are these chain gangs of penal laborers walking around. They are the back, they are the panoramic back, backdrop of everybody's daily life in New Orleans, just seeing um, chain gangs of penal laborers, you know, at least a hundred each day by and large being, uh, whipped and laboring. They are 
they are the scenery of the city. Every tourist in the city comments upon it and notices it. Uh, they're both omnipresent and invisible. And I, and I, it's clear that 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 constant omnipresent spectacle of violence is performing really, really important cultural work, race making work, ideological work there. Um, you know, I'll give you a, just to give you an example. In the 1830s, the warden of the state penitentiary up in Baton Rouge writes a letter in which he describes how he decides how and when to whip a white convict. And he has built in his penitentiary a replica of the whipping machine used in the New Orleans slave workhouse. And he says that he writes in this letter that he uh, has white convicts whipped on this machine sparingly because he wants them to both associate the punishment with enslaved bodies, but he doesn't want to dilute that association or erase that association by overusing it on white people. I mean, what I'm, what I'm struck by in that like deeply disturbing anecdote is how thoughtfully deliberate authorities were in how they deployed violence towards the reification of race. Like they knew what they were doing and they were, and they were being act, acting with real deliberateness in the ways that these public spectacles of violence are enacted. And I think, you know, we see the same thing where we see this theme emerge in Steve's work and we see the way that civil rights photography either does or doesn't use the the, the example of New Orleans, of, of, of the violence in New Orleans during the civil rights movement, right? It, it's just to speak to, to uh, Nikki's work. Um, yeah. Um, there's, there's one thing that I like, uh, Put what you just said in the chat, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Maria, do you, I, uh, I mean, in a way, the courtroom is a space of spectacle as well, right? So, um, in terms of you're, you're looking at the, I think what you said was um, rethinking what state violence looks like. So, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think by focusing on the production of paper of these documents that, you know, traditionally we kind of take as uh, inevitable. There was a sale, so of course there was a contract. Um, but by looking at how and where and when enslavers produced and like archived these documents with notaries and with the Orleans Parish Recorder, you see what John was talking about. You see a deliberately violent and archival process that changes the course of people's lives. Um, and one of the, and I was trying to think about how my work contributes to how we see New Orleans. And I think, you know, Walter Johnson shows us the space of the pen and the physical space of the market. And now we have Stephanie Jones Rogers showing us how these negotiations take place within the home and constantly. Um, and then you have, you know, Dinah Ramey Berry and how uh, people, were, how people were commodified changes over time according to their age. And the, the thing that's, one of the things that's scary about what I'm doing is uh, it expands how we understand the market in New Orleans and I think elsewhere, because where's the market? It's anywhere you can write on a piece of paper. Um, I think that defines people's experiences too. Um, so in that way, maybe broaden what we think of when we think about the marketplace as well. Uh, but yeah, I'll, 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 I'll stop talking. <laughs> 
Well, it makes me think too of of um, resistance to that, right? As well, in terms of, of say someone like Solomon Northrup, who because of the dense records in New Orleans um, and the the acts of sale and the notarial registries and all of these things is able to, unlike um, Betsy, um, he was able he was able to go back with with help and you know tr create that paper trail right and document his his freedom so it, it could work it, it could work uh, but often didn't work in an enslaved or accused enslaved people's favor for sure. Um, the audience have any questions for the panel? I want to make sure that if you do please put them in the chat. We're, we're at ten thirty eight. We're supposed to go at 10.45, so if there are any questions you might want to um, pose to our panelists, we'd love to hear from you. Um, yeah, I, I could, well, I don't know if we can hear you, but I'm curious as to that point about New Orleans, the photography, so the, so I guess the photography of the civil rights movement in New Orleans, you're suggesting is, it does not document violence as much. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, since you gave us a list of your photographers, um, does it also have to do with who's producing these images, or when they're producing them, or you know, is there something else factoring into that? Because as we were sort of discussing their violences, it's part of it, but why is it not part of the, the imagery we're getting? Hopefully we can Was that just for Nikki Molly? You were you were cutting out or speeding up a little bit again, so I didn't. I got photography, so I thought you were talking to Nikki, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> it has indeed. Is it me? Am I yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll leave. Yeah, you're. Uh, So Molly's way of cutting out is much different than Nikki's way of cutting out. It's fascinating. Thanks. Maybe question, uh, questions from the audience in chat, maybe? I'm back. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So my question to Nikki was why the violence is not showing up to be, to be brief in, in, in what you're looking at. If we're talking about this sort of day-to-day -day violence, that is sort of one lens to put on the history of the city. Why is it um, something that seems to be missing from your, the things you're looking at? Okay. Um, well, I think we've we've touched on all of our themes. Am I am I clear? Can everybody hear me right now? Um, uh, of uh, race and violence and and representation to to some degree. Um, we haven't talked as much about labor, and I'm I'm curious if there's um, uh, something we would like to add along those lines. One thing that occurs to me is that makes New Orleans interesting from that perspective is that rural urban dynamic that exists in the city, right? Where if you spend any time like Maria or anybody else spending time looking at these documents in the archives, you can see this very fluid boundary between rural and urban um, that affects what goes on in the city. And of course the city affects what goes on in the, in the rural areas around, but can we talk a little bit about that in our last few minutes um, um, as how that kind of shapes the, the the nature of the the history of the city. Yeah, I mean, again, I think it completely tears asunder asunder these ideas of New Orleans exceptionalism. When you look at there's this constant, you know, when you look at 
the constant flow of slaveholders back and forth between their rural plantations and their urban townhouses, the constant flow of fugitives from rural regions up and down the Mississippi River into New Orleans with the hope of either hiding in the city or sneaking aboard a ship out of the city. And then the constant flow of hired wage workers, and I'm speaking about the antebellum era right now, but this is also true in the postbellum era, the constant flow of wage workers up and down the Mississippi River, you know, and, 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 and you know, Maria's work spoke, this is, you know, Betsy is doing, was doing this work as well of, you know, a couple of weeks working in New Orleans, a couple of weeks working in Louisville, a couple of weeks of working in Pittsburgh. And that's happening to a scale that I think we've only kind of, we're only beginning to really appreciate, or that was happening to a scale we're only beginning to appreciate. Um, so again, it's not, New Orleans is not this, was not this isolated island, separate from an authentically rural South and separate from a authentically, you know, it's some kind of fundamentally different South, right? There's th those boundaries are, are not only, I mean, that, permeable they're 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 non-existent to a degree maybe i'm over maybe i'm overreaching here but i mean you spent any time with with the, the 1900 census looking at the parts of town where robert charles was was living i mean it's place of birth mississippi 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 you know um even the Louisiana's, you know, I mean, that could be it's a New Orleans native, but it could also be somebody from from outside the city. I mean, it, it you know, half the population on certain blocks came from Mississippi, um, had been born there. And, you know, that just gives you some sense of of that, you know, movement sort of back and forth. Um, Michio has a question in the, the chat, which is a good one. The global impact of New Orleans and history and how your discussion could contribute to the ways in which we think about the role of New Orleans in the transatlantic and transpacific. No one want to take a swing at that one. Apparently our topics will not contribute to that discussion. <laughs> well, we've, we've, <laughs> Uh, but there's certain, you know, certainly there is. Um, if we're if we're talking transatlantic, there's 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 you know, Rebecca Scott and others have have um, documented the circuit um, um, across the Atlantic, and certainly uh, Gwendolyn Midlow Hall has documented this circuit from the west coast of Africa. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a it's a question that you know, as if it's not hard enough already to talk about New Orleans, like how you, how you incorporate all of this. It's that's also a huge part of understanding the history of the city is that that circulation of ideas and people um, uh, uh, related to its colonial history, but not not bound to it. So I wonder if you could maybe you could talk a bit about it. Maria. Do you see anything like that in in the court cases, especially since you're looking at a, a, an earlier period? Yeah, that that question made me think of uh, a few freedom suits where you know, uh, plaintiffs in these lawsuits, they really give you these brief, usually fairly detailed bio historical biographies of themselves. Uh, and those are not by no means confined to New Orleans. Uh, you have people claiming, hey, I, I earned my freedom in Saint-Domingue. And then you have judges in New Orleans grappling with, well, what did it mean to earn freedom in Saint-Domingue? And how can we confirm with documents from this island that this person is in fact telling the truth? Uh, so you have these these people who demonstrate their freedom somewhere else, and then as they're in or traveling through New Orleans, they have to do it all over again. Um, th those connections are absolutely there, and and I'm with Molly. There are other historians who pull on those threads quite a bit more than than I think I do, but but they're certainly there. Yeah. I mean, also that this isn't direct this is kind of riffing off of Michio Yamanakanaka's uh, 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 question here um you know I'm really struck by these questions of who can be seized in the streets arbitrarily you know who do police have the power to simply grab grab and nullify any sort of due process right and many of those people 
are uh, South are immigrants or sailors from Southeast Asia uh, who are categorized as black suspected fugitive slaves by police and jailers, but who are protesting, you know, hold up, I'm from Manila, hold up, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm from the Indian subcontinent. You know, again, in these spectacles of violence, there's this effort to, there was an effort to construct a, a particular racial order in which or, or a, a, a particular sense of whiteness and a particular sense of non-whiteness that um, was perhaps you know, more complicated than we can really appreciate or have yet to appreciate, right? Um, yeah. You know, we forget that New Orleans was a, or we don't forget, but, you know, <laughs> in, in New Orleans was an international trading outpost connected to uh, to not only in this Atlantic currents, but also connected to uh, Asia and uh, to the Asian trade. And New Orleans was really throughout the 19th century was 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 navigating a really this complex set of rush, of racial powers. Anyone else on that? We're, we're nearing towards the end of our time. Um, I just want to note, Sophie made a suggestion about markers. Um, if I'm reading this correctly, using the voices of enslaved people, right? So it's sort of a different kind of marker, um, which I think is a great idea. I, you know, I am a big fan of digital humanities and digital history. New Orleans Historical does have a few of those kinds of um, uh, stories in it, but it certainly could have more. Um, Freedom on the Move, full of stories. <laughs> um, uh, and, and we are brainstorming now about how to um, translate that into something that people can experience in the landscape itself um, through individual um, sites of escape um, uh, and uh, um, that's what we're looking for havens um, that might have existed for, for people um, looking for those archipelagos of freedom that Jessica Johnson talks about. So um, any closing remarks from anyone? If not, I think I'm right that we were supposed to close at 1045, is that right? Okay. Um, thank you everyone for bringing your work um, to the table, <laughs> um, uh, to the round table. And thank you the audience for listening. We really appreciate it. There's so much more to talk about um, with New Orleans. I think we need two or three panels probably. <laughs> okay, I guess do we sign off now? Yes. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.